Okay, so thank you. Um, welcome everyone. I wanna thank you and I'm excited today to be talking, talking with Dr. Paul Brentley of the North Carolina uh, Faith and Freedom Coalition. And we're gonna be discussing today two events that are happening in Marion, one in August and one in September. We're gonna to be touching on those and we're gonna hear from Paul about what exactly is the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition in his involvement as an ambassador. And first of all, I wanna tell you all a little bit about Dr. Brentley. Um, he is a senior pastor and founder of the Christian Fellowship Assembly in Dallas, North Carolina. And he has been all over through uh, ministry work in starting churches in places like Mozambique, Canada, Haiti, Israel, Germany, the list goes on and on. So he's done a lot of work. Um, he's also a successful entrepreneur and he's owned multiple businesses, including um, a paralegal firm. Um, he's owned multiple franchises with um, Subway, Dent Max, as well as an all-state insurance agency, which I believe you're currently in right now, Dr. I do. My son runs that. Okay. Um, he attended Duke University School of Divinity, where he furthered his studies in gospel. Um, he has a paralegal degree from King's College and a Bachelor of Theology from Agape College. Um, and also you did um, a ministry degree from Piedmont College of Theology, correct? Correct. Yes. Awesome. All right, so without um, any further description, I wanna to introduce to you Dr. Paul Brentley. Thank you again for coming on board. We're happy to have you and hear what's going on with um, North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here and to have this invitation to share a few things about the things that I love, what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about business. I like to see people be successful. I wanna be successful, but uh, ministry is my heart. Uh, that is the, the, the drumbeat of my heart is ministry. And so uh, I, 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 I don't take it lightly to have this opportunity to share with you some of the things that I do ministry wise. And the main thrust is the North Carolina faith and freedom outside of my pastoral uh, ministry. And that's going around the state and encouraging believers to vote what they believe and uh, have a biblical worldview. And so I do travel over the, all over the state doing that, some outside of the state as well. But the majority of my time for the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition is here. Okay. So in what type of events are you speaking at individual churches? Are they larger events? And what are you, what are you presenting to them as far as the biblical worldview? How is that presented as sure. in your organization? So it's a combination. I, I'm in a, a lot of GOP monthly meetings. Um, they can be small, you know, 20 or less or 30 or 40. And then I have bigger venues. Our, our largest is our big conference that we have every September called Salt and Light, where there'll be close to 2000. Um, and then, but so between there, I'm speaking at churches and, you know, various church congregation sizes throughout the state. So, um, at those events, I am talking about voter education, uh, that voters need to be educated on the, the, the values of the candidates. So not so much about the party as I am about what does the candidate believe. Mm -hmm. And so depending on where I am in the state, I may have local candidates that I have spoken with personally or have gathered their information um, through our researchers, have gathered their information and given that to me what they believe uh, from a biblical worldview. And so I will talk to the voters about that, that this particular candidate has these particular beliefs when it comes to lining up with the Bible. This is how they look, either from research or from my personal encounters. Okay. And then if I'm, not, if I'm not doing something as specific as voter ed for a candidate, then I will be doing voter ed from a party perspective how the different parties believe from a biblical worldview, that the biblical worldview must be their base and all of the decisions that they're making when it comes to the legislature, local government, they need to be standing on that, on that platform. Mm -hmm. So that's my main thrust. Then to reduce that down to the next level, then I'm talking to the voter 
and saying, okay, you know what this candidate stands for now, and we want to help them uh, get into office, but you as an individual need to, to know that you can talk about your faith, you can, in, you can incorporate your faith into your uh, political arena, and don't be shy about that. So I have some steps on how to do that, how to talk faith in a political environment, not being afraid to do that, knowing that you have a database of people behind you that are standing with you when you do make those type of stands. And so those are the main things that I'm doing. Um, I love what you're doing and I think it's very much needed. I have a couple questions based on what you said. Sure. So the difference between, you know, as far as I, as far as I know, from what I read, the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition is is a nonprofit organization. They're also a nonpartisan organization. That is correct. So what we're looking at, what you're looking at as an organization is you're coming from look. This is our litmus test. Is are the biblical world view of your position on particular issues that are coming before the legislature. Is that correct? Right. That is correct. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we're, that's what we're doing. That's what we're talking about. So there's a, there's a, a group of, or, or a, a certain, you know, certain belief out there that, you know, as Christians, we are not to be involved in political activism or, you know, the body politics as it, as it is. Um, how can you can you speak to that? Sure. So that's 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 my forte, uh, because I get that when I show up somewhere that either if I'm a one on one with a pastor or a group of pastors, the first thing they say is, well, we can't get involved. And so I I can bring up a couple of reasons why they don't think they can. You know, they're going to lose their 501c3 or their religious status if they get involved in politics. And that's a myth. You're not going to. It, within the 501c3 uh, laws, you can talk about politics. Now, you can't endorse a candidate. So mm -hmm. that's where the confusion comes in. That you for, And say, for an example, a pastor, he can't endorse a candidate from the Bible stand uh, or on another way, maybe to put it on behalf of the church. Mm -hmm. He can't endorse a candidate personally. So, you know, there's a fine line. How do I endorse a candidate personally? And I can't do it in the church. Well, the first thing that should pop in your mind, you can't do it from the Bible stand, from the pulpit, mm -hmm. uh, in the name of the church. And so those are the kind of things we have to navigate around to let them know that they can still endorse a candidate. They can endorse a party. Um, they can stand behind a, a group of individuals, a single individual, um, but they just can't do it in the name of the church as a 501c3. So that's, that's the first farce. The next one is the believer. So there's members in the church that vote and they, they vote every election. Some in the primaries, in the general, and they vote. And then they think, well, I can't talk about this, this in church, how I, I'm going to vote. But no, you can. It's not against any law for you to be able to talk to your fellow parishioners, to your church, to testify, um, anything like that about. And it's not voting. unbiblical. And it's not unbiblical. Mm -hmm. so, so that I get that question. Well, I get I get I get it from the law, but how about from the Bible? Mm -hmm. So there's voting in the Bible. Uh, Moses came with came 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 upon a time where he was concerned about how to handle all the people. Mm -hmm. And his father-in-law came to him and said, Hey, you can do this, um, but you need help. And mm -hmm. the way to do it is let's split the people up and then let's make the biblical term is captains over these groups. Mm -hmm. Well, there were like four criteria on what those captives captains had to have in their personality, in their belief system, in the way they carried themselves, in their intellect, their ability to think. And so there was a list of requirements. And then there were people that fit those requirements. So this is from my Old Testament uh, view. And then based on that, they were elected or picked or chosen to lead those groups. And so I talk about that. Then going to the New Testament, you know, we look at the deacons in the church and the apostles got to a time where they're like, hey, this is too much work for us. We've got to find some other guys to help us take care of this work. And so they said, let's elect some deacons. 
And um, they began to find them. And then there was a standard. They had to have these reports. They had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was a list of things that they had to check boxes on before they could be a deacon in the church. And even backing up before that, the apostles, uh, when after Judas left the group, uh, they said, we need to replace Judas. Well, how do we replace Judas? They cast lots. Yeah. And there's a scripture in Proverbs says the lot is cast into the lap, but the disposing thereof is of the Lord. So God knows when you roll the dice or cast a lot or make the vote, ultimately he's going to put in office who he wants to put in office, but that doesn't alleviate you from the responsibility of voting. Mm. And so the apostles voted and they were, or first, before they voted, there were only two individuals that met the criteria, Matthias and Barnabas, I think it was, or, or I think it was, I may have that wrong. And so I've never talked, I, I never talked about it. this before. <laughs> we'll go, that's Acts chapter one, second half of the chapter, before Acts chapter two. And so they, I know Matthias, because the, it says the lot was cast on Matthias. So Matthias won. The requirements were they had to be with Jesus from the beginning. And they had to be baptized of John. And so two men met that criteria. And so they got into office. We don't hear a lot about them. A lot of theologians will discuss at Duke. We discussed it. That should have been Paul's spot. The apostle Paul, they shouldn't have put anyone in there. But anyway, uh, Paul really didn't meet the criteria. So he couldn't be in that position. He didn't. He wasn't with Jesus and he wasn't baptized of John. So I said all of that to say, we have a responsibility. We can get involved in politics. Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to avoid paying taxes. I'm going to do what the law says. So where we miss it is we think that there should be a separation between the church and the state, but that was never in the founding documents. That was an, a thought, an ideology. If anything, our forefathers wanted us to be to, to integrate our church belief right into politics. I think the confusion on that separation of church and state, there's the different thought processes. Some people say, well, no, they're not supposed to be together at all. And the what I read into it is that it, there's not to be an organized universal religion for everyone. Exactly. So the government can't say this is our religion. Right. that's where the separation comes it's like each man is is has the right to individually worship as they see fit that i agree with that and that the church can't be overruled by the government it's meaning like yes. they can't shut us down they shouldn't be able to tell us when when to worship when not to worship or even how to worship so that should be left up to the believer and the quote unquote group or organization so the government it was more about exactly what you said and to keep the government out of the church not to keep the church out of the government mm -hmm. yeah no government shall make a law pertaining to the religious yeah that's Bingo. very important so i'm gonna i've got actually a list of questions that i had written out for you i'll well, you didn't send in. them to me in advance so that's not no, fair. well this is your this is your test i'm putting you on the spot here see how you're no you're gonna do fine okay um so i want you can you tell us a little bit about the mission and goals of the north carolina faith and freedom you did that a little bit and how it aims to make a positive impact on the communities where you go what are your so what is your outcome that you're looking for when you when you come and you speak and you hold an event? What are you hoping to come out of that, the response from the people? I know that encouragement is is part of your mission statement. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do how can we encourage and impact our communities? So it's almost like coming out of a, a revival. You know, someone goes to a revival to and not to give their life to Christ. It's just is to help the base already get re-energized. Mm. Well, that's one of our main focuses when it comes to politics and the election. We want to go in with a with our biblical worldview. We want to revive our base. We want to encourage them to let them know they're not standing alone. So mm. they can look around the room and they see other uh, evangelical voters, uh, people of like faith that are all excited about it as well. So those are some of the things we want to do to let you know you're not by yourself. Um, we have 2,600 churches in our database and a lot of people say, well, man, that's a lot. Yeah. But it's a drop in the bucket. And, you know, I'm okay. going in, I'm yeah. in Marion in McDowell County yeah. and there's probably 2000 churches there. So throughout the state, we have 2,600 that 
give out our voter guides. So another way to measure our success is to get more churches added to our database. Mm -hmm. We have over a million people in our database that get our emails and all those things. Well, that's a drop in the bucket too with the size of our state. So we, to, and to encourage those that are already in, but we also want to bring new people into the coalition to let them see that they, they too can voice and express their feelings about their belief system. I love the education part and you're, and you're interviewing the candidates and you're letting, you're finding out, you're asking those critical questions um, regarding biblical foundational um, values Mm -hmm. which they're going to bring into their office. And that's important to the, to the, the Christian, right? The, the Christ follower. Absolutely. So in a lot of times when you go on um, websites or you get the pamphlets by the voter, by, you know, the traditional government voter guide, there's really not mm -hmm. a lot of information that's going to help you um kind of a, does this voter align with my values at right. the core, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of that information. There's some educational background. There's some, you know, here's what they've done. Um, you can look up voting record, but that's a lot of work. So to have a resource where you've got a trusted and vetted organization, such as the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition to say, here's what our research has has come up with right here's the here are these candidates and this is you know i don't know if you present it like an interview form or check off this is how they you know this is how they speak on this particular bill or what have you yeah so in general a little bit yeah so like a, our voter guide will have both candidates on each side so we have their photo their name and then we'll have down the center of the voter guide a list of issues biblical value issues and then on each side, we'll have a yes and no. This candidate does believe in this. This candidate does not believe in it. And it'll go down the list, maybe 10 uh, questions or 10 values and um, just to see where they stand on them. Mm -hmm. And so we, if it's a statewide race, you would get it for you know the whole state. But then if it's smaller races, then it, those are generally on the back. And then we even do them for judges as well. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Um, next question is what specific initiatives and projects um, has the Faith and Freedom Coalition undertaken in North Carolina to promote its core values and engage with the local community? Well, there was, you know, Roe was just overturned mm -hmm. and um, we, we had a, a huge footprint in the state to move the abortion um, ban, moved it from 20 weeks down to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still some the governor the governor signing off on that but we were big on that that's the most recent and it was huge for us we we would like to see it zero weeks or a heartbeat um, but we're just not there yet but we had to go into the the state legislature and have those type of dialogue and discussion with those legislators that were going to be voting and help them to be able to go in there and know there was a constituency behind them that was going to stand by them when they made that vote and you would be surprised at the ones that were on the fence that wasn't sure from both parties um, that were just not sure that how they could change it from 20 to 12. Well, we were pushing for zero, mm -hmm. but we had that dialogue with them and said, well, let's just take off what we can. What, who do, where do we have enough votes? And, um, and so we were there on the grounds doing that, knocking on their doors, uh, sitting down with them, having meals with them. Uh, sharing sharing those points, letting them know we'd be behind them after they made the vote. Uh, we had to uh, still stand up in press conferences and, and and media outlets to let them know, yeah, they voted that way and we're still behind them. Uh, that I makes think that's an important part to to not stop once you think that the victory has been made. There's yet work to be done and especially to show that this is a this is a commitment that is not just on one particular thing. This is an ongoing commitment right. that the organization has made and you as an ambassador has made. Now, I wanted to ask you, you know, in speaking with legislature legislators, did you did you find it was a matter of education, lack of knowledge on certain issues, confusion? What was what were the things that you needed to address most prominently? 
it is lack of education. They, we, we believe because they're so smart, they're in office, that they're just up on everything. No, mm. there's so you you look at some of those bills. They're so inundated. They, absolutely. Yeah. How too much. Mm. And they're just waiting. They're sitting in their offices waiting for somebody to come by and say on page eight, line 12, mm. the bill says this because they have no idea, no clue. I mean, they isn't just that the public's job? Isn't that the informed public's job to to go and help yes. and serve their in a way, serve their their legislators, serve their leaders, and say, right. "This is what's going on," or "Did you know this was in here? Can we talk about this?" That's right. Because, like you said, they're one person, mm -hmm. and when they get in there, they're inundated with so much information and rules and regulations and protocols and things of that nature that they're that they're acclimating to, right? Right. If they're new, mm -hmm. um, and even if they're not, there's still a lot to to be done. That's correct. So There's a lot of we, new things. As we believers and, and just informed and passionate citizens that love our country can get involved and say, I'm going to read about this bill mm -hmm. and I'm going to specifically highlight and I'm going to write to them. Right. I'm going to send an email. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. A text, an email or go by or uh, sign a petition. There's so many ways that you can let your voice be heard. And believe it or not, they're looking for it. You think, well, they got, they get 10,000 emails. They don't want to hear from me. No, they're not. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. They're not getting any emails. They're not hearing from anybody. They're mm -hmm. twiddling their thumbs, wondering based mm -hmm. on their own head, should I vote on this? Should I not? Um, they don't know what the base is saying back at and home. And it there. really does a decision that when you're making a decision that's going to impact mm -hmm. the people that you serve, having that conversation and it's really not about you know what do i think about it right it should be about what do the people that i serve what is the consensus of the people that i serve what are they passionate about and what are their concerns and you know on the big issues they like we're talking about abortion they'll have polling on that and that can mm -hmm. help them but there's so many smaller issues and even on the local level that never get polled so the only way to for them to find out is for you to talk to them. Mm, absolutely. Um, next question is how does the faith and freedom coalition work to bridge the gap between faith-based principles and public policy, particularly in the context of the North Carolina political landscape? Yeah. Again, it's, you know, connecting those dots from the pulpit, to the pew, to outside the church, to let people know, yeah, the church has a, a value and a belief system. And you may be a non-believer and not have that same belief system based from a biblical worldview, but you just a good person, so to speak, mm -hmm. or you have good values. Mm -hmm. So those good values happen to be biblical values and vice versa. Our biblical values happen to be good values. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we need to, people to understand they can be married together without you coming into my church or the church down the street, mm -hmm. but just being a good citizen, um, like the police, you know, believing in the police and knowing that we need yeah. police protection. Some of those things are just natural, but people don't think, well, that must be a church view or that's a worldly view. Well, no, it's a, it's a biblical worldview. It's just coming from maybe a non-biblical person, but yes. our original foundation was built on biblical worldview. So that's why we have that foundation, but a lot of people don't know that. So we have to marry the two. That's, that's an interesting uh, point that you bring up the division, the mental division that I think people make between I'm a good person, but I'm not going to be biblical. But when you right. look at the value system of treating other people's well, treating other people well, serving the homeless, they mm -hmm. are really entwined. Um, and, and the division is, is almost just in our heads, right? Right. If we say, okay. And I, and I think it's a little bit of the label, you know, take this label off, take this label off. You're a non-Christian, you're mm -hmm. a Christian. It's like, wait, you're another human. Let's serve these people together. That's right? correct. I use yeah. the example of marriage all the time. Someone will say, I'm going to get married and they're not a believer. I'm like, why are you getting married? You know? And they're like, well, that's the right thing to do. And I'll say, well, that's a biblical principle. Marriage is. And so a lot of times people are doing great things and they just don't understand that they're, that, that we agree on them because they're of our values. 
Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Number four, can you share some examples of successful advocacy efforts um, with, from the organization that have influenced legislation or brought about positive change in North Carolina? Yeah, going all the way back to the bathroom bill, um, mm, okay. you know, women, women's sports, uh, we were big on that to make sure guys weren't playing women's sports here in the state. We got a problem with that na nationally, but here in the state, we have some victories with that uh, to keep boys out of girls' locker rooms and vice versa. Some girls out of boys' locker rooms. Yeah. Um, we've worked on that. We mentioned abortion. Um, we mentioned the police that funding for our, our police officers and, and um, people that are defending us every day on the streets. Uh, we've been big behind that and have, have some trophies from behind that. And so we, we're we just engaged on the things that are day-to-day -day issues that people need to be aware of. Real quick in line with that, because you talk, we talk about, um, I'm gonna look really quickly at um, some of the, the principle, the issues that, where did I go here? Under the, there are specific issues listed here on the website that mm -hmm. I wanted to go over on okay. there. I think it's the About Us. Let's meet the team. Mm. Let me see if it's on the homepage. Okay, so pro-life issues, pro-marriage issues, religious liberty, mm -hmm. criminal justice reform, school choice and combating human trafficking yes so of of each of these does it ebb and, and flow as in regard to what is needing the most attention in at the time right and not only statewide but in local jurisdictions so all of those issues that you listed in charlotte they may need us to talk about human trafficking mm. in McDowell County, they may need us to talk about religious liberty. It just depends mm. on the environment. Those are our fortes throughout the state. And based on the ebb and flow of what's going on, we will work on that in particular. So human trafficking is something we just got some legislature and legislative uh, material passed and finances uh, to be able to support those organizations that or out there working against human trafficking. The North Carolina Institute Against Human Trafficking, we got them funded. Um, so it's, there's a lot of things out there that we're doing. We're not lobbyists, but because of our relationship with those legislators, we, we are able to go in there and talk to them about these points. And then they will in turn listen to us because of the weight we have behind us and get some things done. So we have those so that we can check boxes. That's in, in the manner in which you approach the you talk about relationships, which is key to anything getting done. It, it right. takes relationship. It takes trust. Right. I have to have trust in you to, you know, listen to your point of view that you Correct. have my best interest or, or the people that I serve their best interest at heart. So talk about forming relationships. The organization started in 2019. So it's right. in, really, I would say, an in infancy. It's yes. in a, you know it's not even really a toddler at this point, right? We right. can do that. Yeah. So how do you how have you worked and and what what do you feel like they're the character points that you're that are helping you to succeed in creating those relationships that are really moving that needle? So our national founder is Dr. Ralph Reed, and he served on the Reagan cabinet. So he started originally the Christian Coalition, and then he moved he dissolved that and changed it to the the Faith and Freedom Coalition. So we're the North Carolina chapter of that. Okay. But Dr. Reed, you know, he's at, I can call him or text him anytime I want to. Our executive director is is only one of four on the national board. Mm -hmm. That's Jason Williams. So we have those type, of, we fostered those type of relationships. And so our national organization, probably a $40 million budget, annual budget is huge. And all over the state, probably 26, 27 state reps um, in the organization. So That's that great. gives us weight and credibility on the local level. 
And then our relationships we fostered. I mentioned our executive director, Jason Williams. He ran the Mark Harris campaign. He was a county commissioner. He has a tremendous relationship uh, status with the legislature. And so that's another advantage. Even though we're young in organization, we have a long, rich history of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Speaker of the House, I coached his, his, we call my son Little Paul, although he's six eight uh 250 taller um, than you yeah, yeah i'm i'm little five eight. <laughs> i'm five eight yeah they should call me little paul That's but great. little paul and i coached the speaker of the house son in soccer we both live in king's mountain mm -hmm. so those type of relationships go way back my business background going you know 96 starting subway i had already fostered those relationships and with that community being the first black uh, president of our Rotary Club, those kind of things built a, a foundation. And then when I moved into this role, I carried those relationships into this role. So if uh, at the time when Tim Moore, Speaker Moore, son was five years old, uh, I had no idea he'd become Speaker of the House, but he did. And so now that is the type of relationships that are there. So I can text him. I can call him. He's endorsed my book. And so you start at that high level, Speaker of the House, uh, the leader of the Senate, Mr. Berger, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mark Robertson. Those are individuals that I can call or I can go to their office and they may be sitting down with the lobbyists and over something major. But when I come by or Jason Williams comes by, they would they would exit that meeting to see what we want. Uh, yeah. what we would come to talk about. And mm -hmm. it would be our call to say, oh, we'll, we'll come back later um, mm -hmm. or make an appointment. But we have fostered those type of relationship with that level of high line influencers. Uh, that helps us to get things done. I have the air. That's fabulous. Um, last question on this official. How does the Faith and Freedom Coalition encourage and empower individuals in North Carolina to actively participate in civic engagement and exercise their rights as responsible citizens. Yeah, so we have an annual conference called the Salt and Light Conference. And all of we we want to pack that thing out. It needs to be great. We've had this is a sixth one. Um, Mount Airy, Winston, Charlotte. Now we're coming to Marion. And we at that time we'll bring in big speakers, nationally known speakers, very expensive speakers. We don't make money off of this conference. Yeah. This is a conference that we bring to town or to a city to uh, to revive our base, to let them know that, hey, we hear you. Uh, we talk is good, but now we see some action. You're bringing and someone I'd never be able to meet, like a Judge Janine Pirro, mm -hmm. a Pete Hexif, a Trey Gowdy. You're bringing them in to my, my backyard. You're mm -hmm. allowing me to sit down with them, Mike Huckabee. Uh, you know, uh, Mike Pence. Um, it's just the, the list goes on and on. You're bringing these people in. I can talk to them. I can have eye to eye contact. And we do that for our base. And so as here locally and throughout the state, we, we have that big conference. And then we have smaller conferences throughout the year called Bold and Courageous, where we may bring in a speaker more or Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson along with another speaker or uh, a legislator or a, a, a band for a concert. Mm -hmm. And we'll bring them in. We'll let, have let the people engage with them. And uh, again, it's encouraging people to go out there and share their, their biblical values among their peers. I think it's important. You're, you're, you said revival, and I love that term that you're using because you're going in and you're really engaging and refiring up um, their passion yes. for what they believe in and how they choose and want to live their life based right. on biblical truths. Absolutely. And I think in this day and age, everything is so, you know, don't talk about who you vote for or, you know, there's, but I, we don't want that to become don't vote. Right. right? Tina, we don't want that, that fear to become. So partnering as you go to these different locations, partnering with organizations the GOP, you said, or even the even the Democratic convention, if they're they're Christians and that, you know, it's not one or the other right. We're not partisan. Right. Right. So we're talking to people and showing them how, you know, this is what this is. This is what we do. 
do we have a call to action or is that something that you leave to the local, how they can get involved or, you know, what ways in which that, that they can contact on a regular basis or establish relationships with their representatives? How right. is that done? Well, T T Tina, you're exactly right in the way you just lay laid that out. And our call to action is to get people to come out and to vote, number one, and then two, to educate other voters. Mm. And to and then third would be to talk to their elected officials. And it could be on the local level, it could be a, a state senator or house of representative, but the, the local level, the mayor, the county commission, the school board, we want to partner with those believers and let them know they can take that right into those environment. They can express themselves. And so you laid it out beautifully just now, the way you listed those things, those items, and that's what we want to do. And so it is a revival. People get excited about it because, yeah. you know, when you're out there by yourself or you think you're by yourself, the word you used a moment ago, fear. Mm -hmm. And so we want to remove that fear mm -hmm. away from people. And I found out that, you know, people say, well, fear, faith over fear. Yeah. But what is faith? Is not what you see. Well, I, we operate by our natural eyesight or mm -hmm. hearing. Um, yeah, and so totally. you need to partner. You need to have your hand in the hand of another believer. You need to see someone else out there. You need to hear someone else chant the chants that you want to chant. Yeah. Um, and so we do that. And so we want to remove that fear from every individual we come in contact with so that they can go out with a passion. Well, and it says that when, when, when one or more are gathered, he's going to be there. And I think that, right. that we always feel in isolation in anything, whether it's political, whether it's a, an emotional thing that we're going through. When we're isolated, we ha we believe this lie that we're the only ones that have ever been through this. We're the only ones that are experiencing this frustration, this pain, this persecution, whatever it may be. We believe that lie that we're the only one. No one has ever felt this way. And I, no one's going to understand. So we don't say anything, but it's like, we have to dispel that and say, come alongside right. other people that may be sitting there quiet and come to a meeting mm -hmm. and sit down and say, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes. That's exactly what are, right. are you, do you know, what questions have you had? Because I know I've had some yeah. open the door to allow them and give them permission to say, you know, come into the room, mm -hmm. right? Sit at the table because it's it's about conversing and building those relationships and those ties. Because when you feel that there are other people believing in the way you do and wanting the same things you do, your strength, inner strength to speak, to make a phone call to your representative or write that mm -hmm. email increases because you know you have someone backing you. Another thing that I wanted to ask is material. So a lot of the public, I do a lot of reading on bills. Um, I do a lot of reading on legislation, you know, before it goes, because, you know, representing businesses, I want to make sure that I know what's in the pipeline that's going to affect the business community, but it's also personal, right? Right. So, is there a resource on the website for the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition to access, um, you know, here's the bill, here's what the concern is, here's what we need to, you know, is there something like that that the public can access? Yes. Yeah, so not so much bills, but we have our voter guides are there. Okay. And you're talking about personal touch. We knocked on literally 400,000 doors in the last election. Not you need people 40. to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. put a plug in here for you. Right. Four hundred thousand doors is a lot. It is so a lot. If you want to get involved and make a difference in you know in the way your community moves forward, then you could be one of those people knocking on those doors. Absolutely. Right. And we're not looking for people to just volunteer to do it. We have a lot of volunteers, but we also compensate people to do yeah. that. So we, you know, those saying, put your money where your mouth is, but we do that. We, we will help fund them on an hourly basis on them going out, putting out door hangers to get the message out. Yeah. So there is a, a, a literal on the ground, boots on the ground, knocking on doors, talking to individuals that anybody can get involved in. And we have uh, individuals that may pass out five voter guides we have them that pass out thousands, but it doesn't matter. Every one of those votes, they do matter. 
Dr. Brittley, I want to ask you, you know, based on, let's say 20 years ago mm -hmm. to now, there, it was almost like there was a sit back and things are set and I don't need to worry about stuff. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to take care of my family. That seems to be the predominant, I want to say, uh, mindset of your basic conservative voter. Want to be you know, less government, right? Right. So what's happened is that there's been grassroots efforts of different things that are not in the same belief system or the mm -hmm. same principles and, and, and core values that have had that grassroots. Do you feel that there is an enough awakening that we can no longer sit back and that, and that as concerned and we have a responsibility I as do. A, a Christian and as a citizen to get involved and how do you feel that that's going from what you're seeing in in the field on the street at the doors well i i do believe that now is the time i believe there's urgency but our base isn't about that there there's still lacks i believe you mentioned about the reserve i think they've they've been lulled to sleep and the enemy did that mm -hmm. and while the other side of the aisle they were very passionate they 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 were had forethought they planned uh, something like CRT didn't just pop up this year or last year. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, they were working on those issues uh, and, and we were just on the sideline, just waiting for, I guess to say, waiting for things that happen. We've been more on the defensive, but we're trying to, we're trying to motivate people to be more on the offensive, to get more aggressive, mm -hmm. to take the lead, not, not be responsive, uh, but be passionate in their beliefs up front. And they're saying, well, we don't, you know, that's not the way we do things on our side of the aisle. But it may not, it may not have been the way we did, mm -hmm. but in order to compete, it must be the way we do. So we have to find ways to get involved and get active and to charge our people to get more on the offensive. I completely agree with you. And I think that, that going to events that you're hosting and, and getting involved is really part of that grassroots efforts. Yes. So I did want to mention your book. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Which and, one? Um, actually, the one that I had that was in your bio. Okay. Was Black Lives Matter 2. Okay. Um, just tell us a little bit about why you wrote it. Sure. Um, and where they can find it if they're interested. Okay. So that book was spawned out of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I play, did a little play on words and used instead of lives, I used lies because, you know, the author, the father, author of lies is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so the black community had been lied to from not only enemy, but from government that mm -hmm. they had to have a certain belief system. So I attacked that in the book. Mm -hmm. And then when during the Black Lives Matter movement, when they were turning over police cars and burning up businesses and knocking out windows. It irked me as a business owner to mm. see that happen to other business owners. So I wrote in opposition of that on how you can let your voice be heard mm. without being violent. Mm -hmm. So we write about that in the book too. And so the book did hit some opposition. People were not excited about it. Um, and I do call out people, not individuals, but a mindset. I call them out in the book. Um, and I let people know that these mindsets are not just black and they're not just white. It's a people problem. I talk about black rednecks in the book. Uh, I talk about um, uh, black uh, privilege in the book. You know, you don't hear those terms. Uh, I talk about uh, prejudice from a black perspective as well. And so those kind of things I worked on to try to debunk a mindset that's out there and to give a voice to the more conservative biblical uh, mindset of the way things should be done. And so that's what that book is about. You can find it on my website, paulbrentley.com. Uh, it is on Amazon as well. It's on walmart.com. Also, um, the publisher's website. So if you Google it, you should find it or Google yeah. me and you yeah, can there find you go. It. <laughs> Google Dr. Brent, Dr. Brentley or Dr. Paul Brentley, Paul Brentley, or 
I, I never did Google just Dr. Brentley. Um, so yeah. maybe. So Paul you have Brentley. another book? Tell me, you had mentioned what you said, which one. So please yeah. tell me about your other book. So I have one called Loyalty to the to the Ministry. I have one called Business by Faith. Then I have, I have. I'm going to have to get that one. Yeah. That's right I, on my alley. Okay. And then I have one called Two Wives in the Pastor's House. What do okay. you think? That That's about? some intrigue right there. <laughs> for those of you that like intrigue, this is the one for you. That's right. Awesome. Two Wives in the Pastor's House. Awesome. So real quick, before I'm going to wrap it up, I want to talk about you also going to be, um, a speaker at an event one that's coming up and let's see, I've got my data here. Um, it's put on by the Christian perspective representative, the C CPR here in McDowell. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be August 26 at 10 AM at the municipal event center. You'll be speaking there. The theme of this event is you will, will you mend the net? And that's based on Matthew 13, 47. So can you speak to that? And, and what is your, what do you want to bring to that event and the mission of that event? Yeah, so basically it's going to be a lot of nonprofit organizations being represented there and from different perspectives, from homeless shelters to saving babies to uh, some church organizations that are have food pantries, different nonprofits that are impacting our community. So what CPR has done a great job is, is collaboration. Mm -hmm. And using the illustration of mending the nets, we're all fishing, we're all out there trying to, to win our base and encourage our base and help them and, and motivate or educate our base. But what if we all work together and there may be some expertise that I have that you may not have, and you may have expertise, or well, I'm sure you have expertise that I don't have. And so you bring those all to the table. And when we're having a dialogue about what we do, we notice where we overlap and where we may be heavy in one area and that other partnering organization could use that help. And so we can share the resources. So when we're mending the nets, and this is a new concept, this we're launching this and they presented it to me. I thought it was amazing. But when we're it's mending- It's a biblical the, concept though. So it's yeah. not really new, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. It's a new from uh, nonprofits using it, I guess. Absolutely. But Jesus did it. And so his, the, the disciples called over the other, when, they're, when they went fishing and their net broke and plenty of, of, of fish, they called over their fellow fishermen from another boat and asked them to come over and they work together and we're able to catch a lot of fish. So our main goal is to help those that need help from a nonprofit perspective. And so coming together for this conference, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be, it'll be more dialogue between the organizations, not so much of a community effort, but we will leave that meeting and more engaged with our community partners on how we can help them and then be more effective. It well. also alerts people to uh, making connections allows people to say, I didn't know we need this, or I didn't yes. know you provided that, or let's right. do this together and raise right. funds and offer more to our community and those we serve in, in exactly. a better and more powerful way Right. so that we find we, we focus more on what unifies us and how we can contribute to that unification of service to our county right. and the people in it, whether it be children, homeless, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be, young mothers, right? Right. right. Um, single we can, parents. We can provide single parents, absolutely. Yeah. We can mm -hmm. provide the needed net of support. Right collectively much better than we can do so in silos that's true i think that we operate on silos way too often way too often and then we do that we're wasting time energy and resources on replicating things when if we brought those ideas together and say oh well i'm going to take this works really well we're going right. to leave that and we're going to put this in here and mm -hmm. then create a unified system or at least a collaboration, a, a, a network like the nets of, of effort to work for the community. I agree a hundred percent. So one more time um, on your speaking engagement for the coalition, we are looking at September 22nd and mm -hmm. 23rd. Right. Okay. 
and that's going to be um, early bird price tickets go on sale June. I think they end June 18th Good, is when correct. the early bird ends on the pricing. Prices start at $25 mm -hmm. um, and that's for like one day. It's going to be, it's hosted and presented by Nebo Crossing Church. Um, and it's, uh, tickets are on their website, but the tickets are also on Freedom Faith. It's uh, ncfaithandfreedom.com forward slash salt and light, correct? correct. That's okay. right. So, and, and Dr. Paul Brintley will be there speaking. Um, he'll be happy to answer any questions um, while you're there. Or there's going to be a little bit of breakout and things where people can can speak directly to you. That is you right. You're going to have some of your books there. All of my books will be there. Okay. I'll be signing books as well. Fabulous. Yes. Fabulous. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I've really enjoyed our conversation and you've given us a lot of great information. And I okay. think that people knowing that this is going on, knowing what you're doing in itself can be energizing for us to say, now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to get more involved. And I hope it does. I really hope it does because we, we work better together. Well, Tina, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our time today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Right. Have a great day. You too.